Welcome to all of you guys, and uh, we can start today again. This is the third session, and this is going to be based on exponential functions. Now, you may have got some idea about that. If you don't, then don't worry. I'll try to explain as many things I can. Uh, let me quickly give you a, uh, an overview what exactly we're going to talk about in this. We'll be learning how exactly we recognize the exponential function. Apart from that, there are basically two types of exponential functions, growth and decay. So we'll be focusing on both of them. Apart from that, um, we'll be discussing different kind of transformations. A few of them we already have discussed. The similar rule, just like you must be remembering the balloon that I have shown to you. Okay. So in the same manner, every function had the same properties of reflection, or oh, sorry, uh, transformation. So they, they all are applicable on that, even on exponential function. Then after, we'll be learning logarithmic function. That is just an inverse of exponential function. And uh, we'll be learning the graphical as well as theoretical method to solving logarithmic functions. And yeah, so that's all about today's session. And let's continue now. So we'll begin with the exponential function. Can anybody tell me about the exponential function if you guys know something about it? Anybody? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, isn't it like, like mm -hmm. something which is like a complete parabola or something which crosses? Mm -hmm. It's a kind of partial parabola, if you imagine, though it's literally it's not correct. Uh, like if I say it's parabola, so parabola is something different. It opens in the same direction, right? But here we yeah. have two different. Uh, direction of the function or of the graph. But overall, yeah, it looks like a curve. So somehow you can relate with the parabola. It's kind of a stretched parabola you can consider. Yeah. All right, students. So we'll have a, an idea about the expression. What expression do we use for an exponential function? So let's now discuss each of the components of the function. So the exponential function is given in the form y equals a times b raised to the power of x. Obviously, you know that y and x are only the variables, whereas a, b, c, whatever we use in our function, they are just the constants, right? But y and x are the parameters, you can say, or they're the variables, whereas x is called the independent variable, y is called the dependent variable. So y can also be represent, represented as fx. So rather than representing in this way, we could have represented the same function as fx equals a times b raised to the power of x. There are a few uh, points uh, mentioned over here, students, that a cannot be equal to zero. Okay, what if, why, why can't a be zero? Any idea, students? Why can't this a be equal to zero? I don't know. Yes, yes, Ian. Uh, sorry, Media, let's let Ian tell this time. Yeah, yes, Ian, please tell. Um, because I think if a is zero, then then y will also be equal to zero because you're multiplying b to the power of x by zero. Exactly. And then y equals zero is a kind of a straight line you must be knowing, right? It's the x. Uh, yeah. x, x, x. yeah, very good. Okay, Media. You may tell me why b cannot be okay. Okay, can b be equal to one? It's simply given it, it cannot be equal to one. So what happens if I consider b equals one? If b equals one, mm -hmm. then um, it's just like it'll always, because anything, because like one to the power of anything. Yes, one, one raised to the power of any number is equal to one only. So again, that's going to be y equals a times one. And that we don't want because y equals a is again a linear function, right? It will change the nature of the function. Yes, you were right. Don't be, uh, don't hesitate. That, that's correct. Your answer is correct. All right, students. So let's consider, yeah, that's true that A cannot be zero and even B cannot be equal to one. But there are two possibilities. B can either be less than one or greater than one. Here, they just said, okay, sorry, less than zero. The given B should be greater than zero. If, if it's negative, then basically there are some different transformation occur that we don't want to discuss right now. Just consider we'll be having two cases where b is less than one or it's greater than one. Okay, if I ask you one thing, students, if I talk about um, 
greater than suppose if I say two, three, four, whatever, if I say in this way, it's obvious than one, right? Greater than one. And there may be certain fractions, let's say three over two, 101, so 100 over say 98. These are still greater than one because they are the improper fraction. Whenever the numerator is greater than that of the denominator, the fraction is also considered to be equal to, basically it's greater than one. And whenever we have a fraction which is less than one, let's say one over two, it's obviously half, it's less than one. Seven over eight, 100 over 101. Whenever we have a proper fraction, it's always less than one actually, right? Because uh, any proper fraction is considered to be less than one, it lies between zero and one. It cannot be even less than zero though. If it's less than zero, if it's negative, then it's gonna be a reflection kind of thing that we will discuss, we'll discuss about that later. Right now, we're just gonna discuss two cases where we have B is greater than one and B is less than one. So the one thing you, you came to know that the function is simply given as Y equals A times B raised to the power of X. And let me just give you an idea how it exactly looks like if we consider B greater than one. For example, let's say if I'm saying B is greater than one, so it could be anything, let's say Y equals, A can be any value. Let's say it's gonna be seven raised to the power of X. Obviously B seems to be greater than one. Or if B is less than one, I can consider that to be suppose Y equals, um, A can be any number. But if I consider particularly B, if I have to consider it less than one, then I would consider basically it's between zero to one. We, we don't consider that to be less than zero because then it becomes negative. And then there is a reflection kind of thing. We'll discuss about that later. Well, let's say it's one over two. Obviously it's less than one, but greater than zero. So students, whenever the B is greater than one, the function is said to be the growth function, growth exponential function. It graph looks like this. It extends at both the directions. So we just draw these kind of arrowheads. And whenever, the value of p is less than one, it's called the decay function, and it looks like this. Okay, students, now you got the idea how exactly it looks like, an overall idea, what's the growth, growth because it, it grows from left to right. Therefore, it's called increasing or growth function. And when it, it decreases from left to right, you would say it's a decay function. Okay, students? Now, one more important thing here, if I talk about A, what exactly is this A? Does anybody know about it? What is this A called in that function? Erin, do you have any idea? Mm. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I was asking, what does it mean by A in the function, in this expression? What this A stands for? The constant? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a constant. But uh, it has a significance, actually. That's why I'm, I'm telling to all of you. Jacinta, any idea? No, I'm not sure. Don't worry. Adwik, do you have any idea? No. OK, never mind. No problem, students. Uh, I'll explain that. Basically, this is the value of A. And that is also called the y-intercept. Why it's the y-intercept? Because that's where the graph intersects the y-axis. And let me now elaborate it a bit more. Let's say I have a function, y is equal to a times b raised to the power of x. To get the y-intercept students, whenever you have to get the y-intercept, it's not only this function, you have any function, right? And you wanna get y-intercept. To do one thing, just put x equals zero. What you have to put? x equals zero. As soon as you put x equals zero in the function, let's see what happens. Can anybody tell me what is b raised to the power of zero? Yes, yes, Ian, please tell. One. One, very good. Just because it's gonna be one here, overall that's gonna be y equals a. It simply means if I just consider that as an ordered pair, it would be kind of uh, x comma y, that is zero comma a. It simply means just because x component is zero, y component is a, so it simply means that A is nothing but the y-intercept. Okay, students? So this A is always considered to be the y-intercept or the other word you can use for that as an initial value. 